Welcome to everyone joining us this afternoon. We're very pleased to have with us Alex Fisher and some of you who, who've um, come to these webinars before may recognize that Alex. Alex has done a lot of webinars for us. Um, most recently, she did one for us on social cognition, which is now on our YouTube channel. Um, and Alex is currently doing a research project into social cognition and Huntington's disease. And if you want to find out more about what that is, then the, the recording is, is on the YouTube channel. But today, Alex is going to talk to us about continuing healthcare assessments. So Alex is a senior occupational therapist working in the Birmingham area who has worked with people with Huntington's for a, a long time. And today's webinar is going to be looking at CHC assessments and in in particular evidence for CHC assessments and how how, how do we provide that. So um, and just to say, um, if there's any questions for Alex, if you'll pop them in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll either, um, Alex may answer them as we go along or we'll pick them up at, up at the end of the webinar. Um, so I'll just hand over to you, Alex, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks very much, John. Um, do excuse me being a bit croaky, folks. I've, um, I've been COVIDed, so um, broadcasting live from my kitchen. Um, so today's webinar, um, it's on a really, really important subject. Uh, John and I were just joking, it's actually quite a deadly dull subject, um, but a vital importance to um, our patients, um, to their families, um, and to care staff and nursing staff, and anyone really who's um, involved in the production of evidence towards health funding. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and apologies in advance, but my um, co-host, Rebecca, um, is also poorly. But I do need to give kudos to her because she's helped me put this together. And Rebecca was a former continuing healthcare nurse assessor. So she really knows her stuff. And this is the angle from which we've come in this presentation. So I'll just uh, share my screen and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. And I'm going to go to the beginning of the presentation. Right from the very beginning and start it up. Okay. So here we go. We've entitled it The Caregiver's Role in CHC Evidence. So that's Continuing Healthcare Evidence. And my name is Alex and uh, my co-host, or certainly the person that I should give co-production rights to, Rebecca Martin Collins. But first of all, continuing healthcare, question mark. So what's the difference between continuing health care and social care funding? So many of you who have joined the webinar will be familiar with social care funding. So that's the funding that comes from the local authority and to which um, a person usually makes some form of contribution when they need care. There's a difference between that and continuing health care in that if um, a person's needs go above and beyond what is defined as social care, then it goes into an arena called health funding. And health funding is funding that comes from the NHS. Um, and that is when the majority of the person's needs are due to their health condition. Okay. Um, now, we all know that social needs and health needs often um, are entangled with one another. So it can be quite difficult sometimes to see what the difference between the two are. So let's try and explain it in this particular way. Rebecca said to me, I need to think about a healthy baby versus a child with an illness. There's a difference in need. So a healthy baby, a mom and a dad would just 
feed normally and care normally for that child. Um, and that might be, if you like, considered um, social care, okay? But a child with an illness has additional needs and they are health-based needs. So for example, that child might need um, particular equipment to support them in eating and drinking. Um, and they might need to be fed in a particular way to avoid choking. Um, they might need particular um, health needs to maintain their skin. So you can see if you can think about it in that, you can get the sort of premise of what the difference is between um, social care and health care. And that's the difference between the two funding streams. They don't often sit separately. Um, local authorities and what are called the um, ICB, the integrated care boards, which have replaced the um, clinical commissioning groups, are required to negotiate together. And sometimes the funding might be pulled from both areas. So there might be a bit of social care and there might be a bit of health stroke nursing care funding. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the definitions of those things. Um, the basic detail can be found on the previous CHC webinar, we, which we did last year, um, and that's on the HDA's YouTube channel. Here we have some examples of health needs for people with Huntington's disease. Um, and you can see that they're divided into domains. So on the um, forms that would be completed to assess for whether a person has health needs or not, they're called domains. And these are just three examples of some domains. Um, the first one uh, is nutrition. And that's a real common one in Huntington's disease. So think about our baby analogy from earlier on. Eating and drinking is social. You might argue that, of course, nutrition is a health need, but actually all of us eat and drink. So eating and drinking is considered social, but eating inappropriate things, the risk of aspiration due to dysphagia, not being able to put on weight because of career or because of changes in metabolism due to Huntington's disease, copious amounts of chest infection, having a peg or a tummy tube is not social. Those are to be considered health needs. And that's what you need to capture in that domain. Let's take skin as another example. Daily non-medical skincare is social. So I think you're getting this by now. So actually, of course, if you had a healthy child and you would perhaps be um, using cream to prevent nappy rash or um, talcum powder, that would be considered relatively social. It's a normal, everyday thing. But monitoring skin integrity due to trauma, so for example, um, non-accidental injury uh, due to career, or not being able to understand the impact of incontinence on the skin, so perhaps wearing pads and not being willing to change them and breakdown of skin, um, having to put padding on bedding or having a cocoon on bedding, um, and perhaps a person perseverating on picking the skin. Those aren't social things. Those are health needs, okay? And they're health needs due to the primary condition, which is Huntington's disease. And finally, the other domain that we've just chosen as an example, is symptom control and management. So being able to take medications independently without difficulty and that aren't specialist, okay, that's kind of social, okay, that's relatively normal, okay. But specialist medication and um, symptoms which um, can't be managed need to be captured and talking with Rebecca about this, she's, I, I was often saying that we often get caught out with this, that um, our nursing um, CHC assessor colleagues will often say it's just about pain. 
But in the case of Huntington's disease, we've actually argued that, for example, um, not all career and not all symptoms can be controlled. Um, and therefore, we do need to capture that in this particular domain. So we do need to consider that career cannot be controlled by drugs. Um, sometimes it can, but often or not, it can't. Respiratory function, for example, might need additional support mechanisms, and that also needs to be captured in this domain. So hopefully you're getting a sense now of what is not social um, and what is health. So the CHC assessment, it's um, an assessment which is carried out via a CHC nurse assessor in combination with the individual, if that's appropriate. Sometimes it has to be family members or other professionals because that person may not be able to consent to the assessment. And that's an important part of the assessment itself because that will go towards evidence about cognition. Um, so sometimes it's carried out with the individual, but also companions and other professionals, particularly a social worker, as well as caregivers. So caregivers, informal caregivers, paid caregivers, care agency staff. Um, the funding is reviewed yearly. I think that's quite important because you need to know that once a person is perhaps granted funding, if they're granted funding, that it's reviewed yearly. Um, so it's not a permanent thing. Um, and that should be an important thing because that means that we need to keep up the level of evidence, okay? The assessor looks at the evidence and it's broken, and that's broken down into those domains as we've just spoken about but they also look at the interaction and the complexity between the domains. And I'll explain those particular words in a little while. But here's the thing, and this is probably why we're talking about this today. Funding is often turned down as the evidence is lacking. Okay, so what can we do about that? because we'll get ourselves into a situation perhaps, for example, where a person might go into nursing care and a team may have worked really, really hard to get them continuing healthcare funding. And then perhaps um, within the nursing home environment, what is happening is that every, you know this person is, is well-managed and perhaps there isn't necessarily everyday evidence of what's going into managing them and managing them well. So then often when you turn to the evidence in the care file, daily care file, or perhaps the care plans, it's not there. And therefore the funding is turned down. And therefore that person gets referred back to social care. And therefore there's a contribution again, and you can see how it would go round and round and round. So actually not having enough evidence is kind of penalizing our patient, kind of penalizing our evident, our, um, our work as well. So we have to work collectively towards this. So why is it important? Well, funding supports you and your employers to meet the additional health needs of the person you're caring for. And that can include, for example, additional staffing um, and specialized equipment. The other thing here is that all of this money comes out of the public purse. So the clinical commissioners, the ICBs, must demonstrate value. Um, and CHC um, nurse assessors, they don't necessarily know the illness, they don't know the person, they don't know their function, so they're reliant on the evidence. It's not just about this person having Huntington's disease. It's not just about the diagnosis. There has to be evidence for the function and evidence for the health needs. So why are you as um, caregivers uh, key here? Um, there's often this question, well, surely it's just visiting professionals and nurses, you know, healthcare professionals or social care professionals. No, not at all. It's everyone's responsibility everyone's because you as caregivers are delivering the daily care you're the ones that notice the difference on a day-to-day -day basis 
Um, so your observations and what you do is absolutely vital. And you need to find a way to capture this. And I've called it making the invisible visible. Sounds like it places a huge amount of pressure on you. And I and I suppose in, in that respect, it does. And I'm not here to cause you any additional work because everyone works extremely hard as it is already. So when Rebecca and I designed this, we were trying to design a way that um, would help you understand that actually, um, if there are certain things in place, there shouldn't be any additional work. So we'll go on to the next bits, making the invisible visible. So this is part one. What I'd quite like you for you to do and what we recommend is that you read about continuing healthcare funding. Um, we don't want you to be experts, but at least know what it is. Um, and at the very least, read about the domains. So you've just heard me um, give examples of the domains. So read about the domains. Now, if you typed it into Google, CHC funding, you could actually come up with the form which has the domains in it. And I suggest that you have a look at that. OK, and you can see the breakdown and the discussions that would be had should you be involved in some form of assessment. And I would suggest that actually, hopefully, as perhaps there are organisations listening here, um, but certainly you as caregivers should be able to say to your organisation, they should support you in giving you training and time to be able to do this. Um, because actually it's in their interest, because actually if funding is lost to support the person that the organisation has signed up to care for, it's certainly in their interest to allow you as caregivers to, um, to understand this process. And then here's the clincher. Everything stems from the care plans. And I'll explain that in a moment. The care plans are vital. They are vital so that it doesn't cause you, you as the caregivers collecting the evidence any more work. So care plans and risk assessments, make sure they're in place and make sure they're up to date because you need to refer to them in your evidence. So, OK, part two of making the invisible visible. What often happens is um, we see in the notes, Mr. X was fine today. So here's the thing. If his needs aren't written down, it's not actually happened. Regardless of what you're doing, the evidence just isn't there. But let's have a thinking for the moment. Think for a moment. What is it that you do to keep Mr. X fine? If you did not do these things, would Mr. X still be fine? Chances are that the way that you're approaching things, the way that you're doing things, the way that you set things up, those are the things that are keeping him fine. So remember, a well-managed need is still a need, okay? Let's go back to that kind of baby thing earlier on, you know, when we spoke about the social care needs of a baby and the health care needs of a baby. Think about the way that you do things. And one of the most complicated things that you probably do is that you get in a car and you drive and you drive automatically. You don't really know what you're doing. But when you were learning to drive, remember how complicated it was. Yeah. When you break it down you can see how complicated it might be to look after Mr. X. And that's what needs to be replicated in his care plan. If the care plan reflects the person's needs, okay, it shouldn't mean any additional work to collate the evidence. So the care plan, what we're recommending, should show the approach, the setup, the environment, for example, um, I don't know, say, for example, you're lucky enough, there's a group of you that go in to see Mr. X. 
and you know the way that Mr. X works and he knows the way that you work. But then one day somebody else comes in and they don't know him and they do something in a completely different way. That's an example of the approach, the setup and the environment, because chances are that might be the day that Mr. X kicks off, for want of a better phrase. So the care plan needs to capture the triggers, what happened before, what upset them already. OK. And then it needs to capture what are the risks. So, for example, Mr. X has a fall on that day and he um, sustains a traumatic injury to his skin. That needs to be captured. And it's kind of actually that needs to be captured because on the days when consistent staffing who don't know the approach setup environment, this is what's going to happen. And does Mr. X understand the risks? Because, again, that's really, really important. And again, in Huntington's disease, it's really important to assess whether that person does or doesn't. And often or not in Huntington's disease, a person in the moment might be able to say that they understand the risks. But what's the actual evidence for that? If they're saying one thing and then doing something completely different the majority of the time, the chances are that perhaps impulsivity is kicking in and they're not understanding the risks in the moment. So that's when that needs to be captured in the care plan. What is it that you do that stops it from happening or reduces it from happening? Indeed, can it be stopped? It's no, um, uh, it's no um, criticism of yourselves if it can't be stopped. Some of the behaviors in Huntington's disease need managing. Um, and so therefore it's bringing about it right down to its lowest point if possible. But if not, I mean, that's an illustration of, you know, behavior that challenges and that also needs capturing perhaps in a separate care plan. But they're interlinked to this particular care plan. What increases the chances of it happening? And here I come back down to cognition, because obviously, as you're aware, this year, um, the Huntington's Disease Association have been talking very much about the mental state of people with Huntington's disease and the impact on cognition on their presentation. So acknowledge the challenges, acknowledge the impact of cognition and how it relates to other areas. So, For example, earlier on, we spoke about skin. If that person doesn't understand the need to cleanse their skin or change their pants, that should be both be within um, perhaps a cognition care plan, a skin care plan, but also in a challenging behavior care plan. And they should all interlink together. So let's consider a common scenario. This is the first one that Rebecca and I came up with. And um, excuse my language, but um, classic one. I want to fag and um, beep everything else. Your care plan should show what you do to support the person and what also happens if you don't support the person within that. OK, so then from that, as we've said, flows your evidence that day to day capturing of what's going on so your notes relevant to the care plan should show mr x was fine because we did x y and z as shown on the care plan on the days it did not work it was because a new worker was present and x happened we did x to address this as indicated in the care plan so you can see why the care plan is so important okay so if the care plan's in place and it's incredibly detailed as it should be then actually your notes should be able to refer back to the care plan for what you did and then what happened because mr x was perhaps a little bit challenging that day and again refers back to the care plan
the final thing to focus on is, um, as we said earlier on, and this is the thing that CHC assessors are looking for, is the interaction between the nature and complexity, intensity and unpredictability that might be happening. Um, and so not only is this just about, not just about diagnosis, it's about the these other issues, okay? And these should also be shown in your care planning. So um, as we just discussed, you can see that there's an interaction already. But let's just revisit them so that you're familiar with them. Um, nature is about how does Huntington's disease impact the individual? How does the diagnosis impact that person? Well, the nature here is that Huntington's disease, the thinking impacts their behavior, okay? And that should be demonstrated in risk assessments, incident reports, for example, harm, upset, property damage, CQC, um, falls, safeguarding, all of those things, okay? Again, it's not a criticism of your care that that is captured. It's really important. In fact, if we went in and we didn't see any of those things, we'd probably be quite concerned. Complexity. Huntington's disease is one of the most complex diseases in the world. We have to manage this complexity. And if we did not, this might happen. So again, you can see in your care plan, you have already said, if there is a new worker, Mr. X may respond in this way. This is what we're going to do to manage it. But actually on this day, this happened, and this is what we did to manage it, or actually we weren't able to, and this happened as a result. Intensity. How often are you having to do something? Now, if you think about Mr. X and you think about what you have to do to maintain his needs, you're kind of doing that all of the time. But often what we hear is frequently. Frequently is not helpful and will not be accepted by the CHC assessor. So it should be, okay, how often is this happening? It can be within a day, within a week, within a month. I mean, and if it's not happening, as I've just said, it's probably because it's a managed need. And remember, a well-managed need is still a need. You are having to make the invisible visible, okay? It's a really completely different way of getting your head around stuff. But you're all probably really, really skilled at this and not aware that you're actually doing it. And so you need to make sure that it's visible. And then we have unpredictability. For many people with Huntington's disease, perhaps you know their behavior is relatively predictable, but there are folk for whom it is not predictable. And we need to make sure that that is present in the evidence. So we did everything in the care plan that we could possibly do, but actually what tends to happen is sometimes something comes out of nowhere um, and this is what we had to do. And as a result, this is what happened. OK, so we did everything but. OK, and if you're thinking about all of these, then and that's all evidence to so care plans, risk assessments and your evidence flowing from your care plans, then actually you stand a really, really good chance um, in the CHD assessment of advocating for the people that you're caring for. So the final bits here and a bit of a summing up is Rebecca and I are recommending that you get familiar with the CHD documents and at the very least, look at the domains, be yeah. familiar with the domains. Do not get hung up on the scores. Um, you don't need to be an expert on this. Your knowledge is needed to advocate for the person and you probably have plenty of knowledge. Make sure the care plan demonstrates the person's needs and the interactivity between the areas so that your evidence can flow from there. And finally, 
person or you should get notice of the assessment, okay? So if this assessment is going to happen, um, CHT, ICB will send out a letter to the appropriate people. Um, so this gives you a chance to prepare. And what we've recently asked certain organisations to do is make sure that the key worker, usually the nurse, and other professionals know, okay? Um, HD is complex and requires knowledge and skills. And if you are not sure, then you must ask and you must ask your organisation to support you in this. I think all that remains to say, Alex, is thank you very much for, for coming along this afternoon and doing that presentation. I think and I hope people agree you've made something that actually can be quite a, a daunting topic and quite complicated, um, particularly picking out things like the differences between the, the um what's social care what's what's health um and this idea around well managed needs are still needs then <coughs> yeah. some of those very key it's, yeah there aren't any um legally uh, legal definitions of social care and health care um you really really have to deep, dig deep into lots and lots of the paperwork but again on our other CHC basics um, webinar, which we did last year, we, we cover those. So even if after today, you're still like a little bit, oh, I'm not too sure, do have a look on, on that one. There's some good definitions there um, and, and, and go from there. Um, and I, 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 wish, I wish you well. I wish you well. I, I hope this has been helpful. So. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.